Amen. Good morning. And welcome to worship as we gather on this sunny Sunday morning that God has given as the world is slowly turning to spring. And we're thankful for this opportunity to gather with each of you to begin a new week with God today. As we do so, we're reminded that we are people on a mission. We have been, each of us, called before we were born, placed in this world, given an identity and a calling. And today we celebrate with one of our youth, a calling on his life. Lucas Double D graduated from high school in May, and he has just been a season of training and service with YWAM Youth with a Mission in Costa Rica, and he'll be reporting briefly on that this morning. We look forward to receiving him back as we've commissioned him and to hear a bit about what God has been doing in his life. Also, each of us are on our own missions, and as you leave the doors of this place, you'll see uh, painted above the doors a sign that says you're entering God's mission field. And one of the ways we do that as a church is we seek to equip those who are called whatever part of your life is to be faithful to that calling. And one of the ways we do that is through our parents, and I want to invite Dan up, our youth director, and he's going to share a little bit about a resource we have to equip you in that part of your mission if you're a parent. So we have now, for this year, access to a resource called AXIS, A-X-I-S. Uh, it is a great and powerful resource that uh, can help equip parents, can help equip grandparents, teachers, youth leaders. Um, so we have put a, a link to that on our webpage. I, I've emailed previously parents about this, but um, there's a link now on our webpage that has the login information. So as long as you have a login on our website, you can get into this website and it's got uh, four different types of materials. There are uh, just parent uh, PDFs that have information if you want to learn more about Fortnite or, or different things that are relevant to youth. Uh, there are teaching summits talking about just kind of how youth learn and how they engage. There are, there's a culture translator that uh, just will send you a weekly email just what are some of the things going on uh, with youth culture just to help you stay relevant help you stay in touch and finally there's conversation kits uh, sometimes it's really awkward to try to start a conversation about some serious topics and so four awesome parts of this resource uh, since it is a new thing and since we do want it to be utilized uh, I just would like to continue to help you be familiar with it. So next week, Sunday, after the morning worship service in the council room, I'll be kind of doing a tutorial and answering any questions. So we'll have, we'll have a screen pulled up that we can kind of go through it. Um, but again, we want to make this available to parents, grandparents, people that anybody that uh, bumps shoulders with youth or even if youth want to access it as well. Uh, just a powerful tool to walk, to walk alongside of our young people. Thank you. Stan. So with those things before us, looking forward to hearing about a mission, engaging in the mission God's called us to, would you bow your heads and let's open this service in prayer. Heavenly Father, we're thankful for each person here, the young and the old, the married and the single, those who come to this place with great joy after a week of sunshine and warmth and new experiences, and those who come to this place experiencing pain and sorrow and worry. Heavenly Father, we thank you that each of us have been given a name and an identity through Jesus Christ. That by your grace, each of us are invited on this mission to serve you in your world as your kingdom comes on earth as it is in heaven. Heavenly Father, we pray that this would be a place of encounter with you. Holy Spirit, that you would move among us, that you would be in the words that we say, in the thoughts that we think, in the actions that we live in this week. Holy Spirit, that you would move in us in such a way that as the world interacts with us, they would find themselves interacting with you, the Creator God. Father, we pray these things in the strong name of Jesus, our Redeemer and Savior. Amen. Friends, would you please stand for our call to worship. Shout for joy to God, all the earth. Sing the glory of His name. Make His praise glorious. Say to God, how awesome are your deeds. So great is your power that your enemies cringe before you. All the earth bows down to you. They sing praise to you. They sing the praises of your name. May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face shine on us so that your ways may be known on earth, your salvation among the nations. May the peoples praise you, God. May all the peoples praise you. May the nations be glad and sing for joy, for you rule the peoples with equity and guide the nations of the earth. May the peoples praise you, God. May all the peoples praise you.
has gathered us in praise and how he greets us with his word of greeting. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit and the love of God the Father be with each of you now and forevermore. Amen. Friends, God has greeted us. It's still a season of sickness. Rather than shaking hands, we invite you again to do the fist bump of fellowship, the holy wave, or the chicken wing of Christian welcome. So greet one another, please. Let's continue to praise the name of Jesus by singing, All Creatures of Our God and King.
you may be seated. Hosea 10 verse 12 calls us to draw near to the Lord with these words. Sow righteousness for yourselves. Reap the fruit of unfailing love and break up your unplowed ground. For it is time to seek the Lord until he comes and showers his righteousness on you. Let's go before our triune God and confess our sins. Please pray with us. Father, we are weak sinners who find it easy to move toward people who make us feel good about ourselves, comfortable and important. We continually show favoritism in our hearts and often with our words and actions. We hate others, sometimes for no good reason, and we do evil to them, damaging their reputations with gossip and rejoicing when bad things happen to them. We know we should love even those who do evil to us, but our sinful hearts rise up, and like Samson, we seek justice by doing them damage in return. All of us have hated, gossiped, and slandered, rehearsing the downfall of our enemies with relish. Father, forgive us. Lord Jesus, we marvel at your faith. You did only good to others, yet the people you loved condemned you to death and mocked you as you died. They rejoiced in your downfall and committed the greatest evil against you, yet you still forgave them. You did not retaliate, exact vengeance, or use your great power to deliver yourself. Jesus, we thank you for giving this shining obedience to us. Thank you for your priceless death that paid the debt. Holy Spirit, help us to survive our weakness and our failure to trust you with our deliverance. Restrain our tongues and bodies and, give a, and keep us from trying to deliver ourselves. Give us faith to trust that you are the holy judge who will carry out perfect vengeance and perfect forgiveness according to your perfect will. Thank you that the day will come when we will see our glorious Redeemer face to face and be like him forever. Amen. Psalm 103 reminds us, The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Praise the Lord. Our sins, they are many. His mercy is more. What love could remember the wrongs we have done? Omniscient, all the of kindness he lavished 
As God's forgiven people, hear these words from Romans 12. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good pleasing and perfect will to prepare our hearts to hear God's word. Let's submit ourselves and sing. I surrender all. As those who have surrendered all, we turn to God's word and expect that he will again speak to us. We are this morning in the book of Judges, chapter 16. We're going to be finishing that chapter, verses 23 through 31, and that's found on page 236 in your pew Bibles, Judges, chapter 16. We are today finishing a sermon series on the life of a man named Samson. I know for many of us this has been an interesting series uh, in lots of different ways. I know personally I haven't cut my hair since we began the series, and I don't know if it's that, but when I open pickle jars, it's just a breeze, right? We all know the story of Samson, and yet very rarely do we dig deeply into it. In fact, as I was researching for this sermon series, I read an article in the Christianity Today magazine called, Where Has Samson Gone? And in the article, the author talked about doing an informal survey, and he asked people questions about if they'd ever heard a sermon on Samson. And most of the people said they could never remember one. They remember his Sunday school lessons, but never as an adult had they heard a sermon focused on the life of Samson. And yet now we've been spending seven sermons 
focused on the life of Samson. The question is why? If you remember at the very beginning of this series, I said I think there are three reasons why this portion of God's word is helpful for us in a unique way. The first of those reasons is because this is a great story. This is the story of a man with flowing hair and bulging muscles who has supernatural strength and who kills his enemies with a blunt object. And those sort of stories are still popular even in the 21st century. Love, violence, riddles, mystery, betrayal. This is a great story. But more than just being a great story, it is part of the big story. As we say often at Bethel, the Bible is not a collection of little antidotes. It is one story of redemption. And even though the life of Samson seems so different than the life of Christ, it is part of that redemptive road that leads to the cross. So it's a great story. It's part of the big story. But then the third reason I said why it's helpful for us, it is, it is our story. Samson is the story of someone of great strength and great weakness. Of great potential and great pain. Of great expectation and great disappointment. Someone who had been given much, but so often failed to use it well. And as we see that kind of a life, we can look in the mirror and look at our own lives. And yet if God can work through a man like Samson, maybe he can work through people like you and me as well. So with those reasons before us, we've been studying this book, and I said, in a way, this is a narrative explanation of 2 Corinthians chapter 12, where God says, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. That's the story of Samson. So we finish that story this morning. Would you please pray with me? Heavenly Father, we surrender all to you including the stories of our lives. Father, you know the struggles, you know the dreams, the hopes, the aspirations, the anxieties, the things that have kept us awake this past week, the things that lie before us in the week to come. Heavenly Father, we pray that you would help us by your Holy Spirit to find our identity, to find who we are, to find our mission, what we are to do, to find our all in surrender to you, our Lord and Savior. Holy Spirit, may you do a deep work in each of us this morning. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Judges 16, beginning at verse 23. Now the rulers of the Philistines assembled to offer a great sacrifice to Dagon, their God, and to celebrate, saying, Our God has delivered Samson, our enemy, into our hands. When the people saw him, they praised their God, saying, Our God has delivered our enemy into our hands, the one who laid waste our land and multiplied our slain. While they were in high spirits, they shouted, Bring out Samson to entertain us. So they called Samson out of the prison, and he performed for them. When they stood him among the pillars, Samson said to the servant who held his hand, Put me where I can feel the pillars that support the temple, so that I may lean against them. Now the temple was crowded with men and women. All the rulers of the Philistines were there, and on the roof were about 3,000 men and women watching Samson perform. Then Samson prayed to the Lord, O sovereign Lord, remember me. O God, please strengthen me just once more. And let me with one blow get revenge on the Philistines for my two eyes. When Samson reached toward the two central pillars on which the temple stood, bracing himself against them, his right hand on the one and his left hand on the other, Samson said, let me die with the Philistines. Then he pushed with all his might, and down came the temple on the rulers and on all the people in it. Thus he killed many more when he died. Than when he lived, then his brothers and his father's whole family went down to get him. They brought him back and buried him between Zorah and Eshtaal in the tomb of Manoah, his father. He had led Israel 20 years. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Friends, sometimes it's only... When death approaches, that life gains clarity. 
Scientists know this, and they actually have a description for it. They call it a life review event. Lay people typically describe it in a different set of language. We call it having our lives flash before our eyes. But whatever you call it, it is a phenomenon that scientists have been able to discover actual explanation for. That the way that our brains are structured, when we are dying, when our oxygen is no longer flowing, the parts of our brains that fire the longest, or that last the longest, are certain structures in our brain where our autobiographical memories are stored. Studies have shown this, and articles uh, pointed out, this one article, your life really does flash before your eyes before you die, studies suggest. And what they found is that, indeed, when you are dying, and the rest of your brain, and all the things that occupy your thoughts fade away, what is left are the memories from the beginning of your life until that moment. And as scientists interview people who've had this, about 8 million Americans, what they find is often people describe it's as if time is suspended, and they're able to see in one vista their life laid out before them. People describe not only seeing things vividly, things they never remembered before, but also being able to enter into the experience of others who are part of their memories to see what they experienced in those moments. One of the study participants described it this way. Some things made me very embarrassed. In fact, revulsion and guilt took away any good feelings, making me so very sorry for certain things I had said or done. I hadn't just seen what I had done, but I felt and knew the repercussions of my actions. I felt the injury or pain of those who suffered because of my selfishness or inappropriate behavior, such as it when your life flashes before your eyes. My question for each of us this morning is when it comes time for your life to flash before your eyes, what will you see? What scenes, what faces? As you survey the vista of your life from beginning to end, will it be a story of triumph and success? Or will there be painful things you wish you couldn't remember but do? Scenes of disappointment and a sense of failure. What will flash before your eyes when you die? That's an interesting question as we look at the life of Samson as it ends. To set us back where we are, remember last week we ended with a very bitter irony. This man who had lived his life doing what was right in his own eyes now dies without eyes. Verse 21. Then the Philistines seized him, gouged out his eyes, and took him down to Gaza, binding him with bronze shackles. They set him to grinding in the prison. This is a terribly humiliating scene. Oh, how the mighty have fallen. And as we join our text today, we see that now the nations of the Philistines are gathered in a celebration of thanksgiving. Verse 23. Now the rulers of the Philistines, these are the five rulers who had paid off Delilah, that king's ransom to capture Samson. Those same rulers assembled to offer a great sacrifice to Dagon, their god, and to celebrate saying, our god has delivered Samson, our enemy, into our hands. Dagon was the god of harvest, the god of crops. And they see the capture of Samson, not just the capture of a man, but as the triumph of their religion and their god. And we see why it was such a celebration in the next verse. When the people saw him, they praised their God, saying, Our God has delivered our enemy into our hands. And then notice his biography. The one who laid waste our land. We think of those foxes burning up a year's worth of grain. A family's worth of vineyards that took decades to grow and then generations of olive groves. And the one who has multiplied our slain, when he beat down those thousand men with the jawbone of an ass, how many families lost a son, a husband? And now that man is captured and the nation is gathered to thank their God. And in the midst of the thanksgiving, they want to add some humiliation. Notice the next verse. And while they were in high spirits, They shouted, bring out Samson to entertain us. And so they called Samson from the prison, and he performed for them. This mighty man, led by the hand by a young boy, to perform as a circus animal for his enemies. 
Maybe like in future years, by the rivers of Babylon, we sat and wept as our captors said, sing us songs of Zion. Maybe they said, sing us some of those Jewish songs. Sing the lullaby your mother sang you, Samson. Or maybe they had this mighty man led by the hand, and then the boy left, and they watched him stumble around blind for their amusement. Or maybe this strong man, now weak, so weak a boy can attend him, made him do feats of strength. Lift up a, a little bar, Samson. Pick this up, Samson. And as he did so, in a room filled with 3,000 of his enemies, his eyes gouged out. He could hear the whispers of children to their parents. Dear God, what is that thing? And the hackles of a thousand voices in his perfect ears. And maybe standing under the pillars of a pagan temple, hearing the laughter and mockery of his enemies, maybe in that moment with a hand on a pillar on each side, Samson's life flashed before his eyes. And if it did, what would Samson have seen? Well, certainly what he's seen would have begun in his childhood. He would have seen all those scenes when he had been told as a kid how an angel had come, not just once, but twice to his parents, and told that this boy that was born, him, was going to set his people free. And he would have remembered scenes in his childhood of how different he was. The village barber shop that he was never allowed to enter into. Hot summer days where his friends had butch cuts, but he had to tend his braids. He would have seen scenes of sitting in his rabbinical school, but never getting a juice box packed or grapes. And while his friends had peanut butter and grape jelly sandwiches, he just got the peanut butter. At birthday parties when they ate the raisin cakes, he wasn't enabled to participate. Maybe he'd remember when his grandpa and grandma died and he wasn't allowed to attend the funeral. He was a Nazarite set apart from all these things. But after those scenes of childhood flashed before his brain, then he would have started to see scenes as an adult where he spent his life doing great things. He would have seen that scene of a matted fur of a lion that he had just ripped apart with his bare hands. He would have seen the bewildered faces of the Philistines when he told them a riddle they couldn't solve without cheating. He would have seen the terrified eyes of foxes that he had captured and the rising dark smoke in a red sky as the valley of Sorek was burning at his bidding. He would have seen heaps of broken human bodies and a bloodied jawbone. He would have seen the dark frame of a gate blacking out the stars as he carried the gates of Gaza 38 miles uphill. Samson would have seen a life of greatness. But also with his hands on the pillars, as he died, he would have seen something else. Failure after failure after failure. Failure written in the pain of his parents' eyes as he demanded a Philistine bride. Pain in the wife that he married as she cried for seven days, begging him to tell the secret so that she wouldn't die. Seeing the flies buzzing above the corpses of his victims. Seeing the pain of the women that he had used throughout his life. Some without even a name for his pleasure. Maybe one of the last things he would have seen as his life flashed before his eyes is the woman he loved, Delilah, stroking his hair as he went to sleep on her lap, only to wake up with a sharp burning object coming towards his eye. And as Samson's life flashes before his eyes, what he sees is not just a childhood set apart and a life of greatness, but a life of failure after failure after failure. As one scholar summarizes it, this is a tragic note. This man with his unprecedentedly high calling and with his extraordinary divine gifts had wasted his life. The man whose birth had promised so much is a disappointment. So many gifts untapped, so much calling unfulfilled. He did not become who he was supposed to be. He did not do what he was supposed to do. And at the end of his life, this is what he sees. Now the question, friends, at the end of our lives is what will we see when our lives flash before us? And maybe to get into that very personal question, let's first back it up and say what will we see collectively? Remember, Samson isn't the only one to fail. He individually was a Nazarite, set apart to God, but Israel as a nation was also set apart to God from among the nations. 
And yet what we've seen all through the Samson saga, all through the book of Judges, is they, like Samson, wanted nothing to do with their calling. And so at the very beginning, rather than crying out to God for the Philistines to be removed, they don't even ask because they're comfortable. And when Samson retreats to the cave and 3,000 of his countrymen come, they don't come to join him against the Philistines. They come to arrest him on behalf of the Philistines. And when Samson single-handedly carries the gate of Gaza and he plants it in Hebron in the territory of Judah, rather than taking it as a sign to invade the open city of their enemy, the people of Judah stay camped behind their own gates. I think collectively we, like Israel today, find ourselves, as I said, the story of Samson is, it's a story of a call to a consecrated life in a compromised culture. And we as a church and as the family of God so often, like Israel, like Samson, are compromised with our culture. As one scholar again pointed out, Samson's behavior serves as a timely reminder to the people of God and to their leaders in every generation of how easy it is to reflect the ways of a prevailing culture instead of transforming it, of how easy it is to become like the world rather than to change the world. The people of God have always been tempted to reflect culture instead of transforming it. But perhaps that temptation is greater in North America today than at any other time or place in the history of God's people. When we review the church of the 21st century, what scenes will flash before God's eyes? Will it be a transformative church or a church that's corrupted? But now let's take that to the personal. What will we see? Well, let's think about the death of one of our heroes recently. A few Sundays ago, at the end of January, a man named Kobe Bryant and eight others died in a helicopter crash in California. Now, I don't know what flashed before Kobe's eyes in his final moments, but I do know what flashed on Twitter within hours of his death. A reporter from the Washington Post, as soon as she heard he died, before his body was even in the morgue, tweeted out a link to a 17-year-old article where he had been accused of rape. And other reporters also began at the very beginning, before he was even cold, to talk about his greatest failure. What's interesting is they didn't talk about the fact that he wasn't convicted, or that he with tears repented of adultery, or that he had settled with this woman. They also didn't talk about the fact that he had gone on to repair his marriage and to be a devoted father to his four daughters. And they didn't talk about the fact that he and his 13-year-old daughter who died with him had come back to the faith and they had celebrated communion the morning of their death in an early morning church service. They didn't talk about that. They talk about the failure. As one journalist reflecting on this pointed out, in 2020, no public figures can die without the immediate condemnations of the worst moments of their life. This is a poisonous way of thinking, not just because it reduces complicated people to their worst blunder, but because it implicitly denies the possibility of redemption. That people who have made mistakes, even terrible mistakes, really can turn their lives around. You see, in 2020, as you have your life flash before your eyes or any other person's life, what matters in our age is that failure is not an event. Failure is personal. Failure is not something you do, it's something you are. And if you have ever failed, if you have ever done anything, no matter how long ago, no matter how sorry you are, that is who you are, and we will never let you forget it. That's you. You are failure. And if that's true of Kobe... How about the rest of us? I read this week a fresh story of a man named Richard. He grew up in the Boston area, very poor. His father died when he was nine of lung cancer, and so his mother had to raise Richard and his three siblings as a single parent working at a candy factory for $1.10 an hour. But Richard had potential. And so he joined the Air Force, and after four years, then he went to study accounting and he eventually got work at a credit union. And he was so good at what he did, he arose to become the CEO of a credit union, making millions of dollars legitimately and legally. He had a 9,000 foot square home, he had a fleet of luxury vehicles, a yacht. Everything was going well. He was filled with gifts and potential and qualities. But then he started another credit union, 
This one, to help him make even more money, but not legally. To help swindle and cheat and funnel things so he could continue to invest and make more and more and more. And that worked until the regulators found out and they closed him down and he was facing charges to go to jail. And he was so afraid that he actually, on the eve of his trial, fled, leaving his wife with 13 packs of $100 bills taped to his body. And he went on the run, a a, a fugitive. He spent that year partying, spending his money gambling and on women. Until one day he found himself with his money gone, his Rolex pawned, empty relationships with women behind him and around him. And all he could do was take some duct tape and some tubing and go from his SUV's exhaust pipe into the window. He planned to get drunk on wine and then to fade away as that terrible life of disappointment flashes before his eyes. That's Richard's story. What's yours? In this moment of honesty, what do you see as you look back? What moments of pain that happened to you? What moments of pain that you inflicted? What failures? What bitter disappointments? What potential did you hear as a kid? Oh, you're going someplace, boy. You're going someplace, girl. And now you look at your life and you wonder where you took a wrong turn. When your life stands before you and God at the judgment day, what do you and I see? And so Samson is standing as a ruined man under the pillars of a pagan temple. With the jeers and hackles of a thousand thousand voices ringing in his ears. And Samson does something for only the second time in his life. At the end of his life, Samson does something remarkable. Notice what he does. We're told that Samson prayed to the Lord. O sovereign Lord, remember me. The only other time he had prayed, he had prayed to live. Now he prays to die. But in this prayer, this boy who was set apart since his birth shows that he learned something from his parents. He addresses God in three different names. He addresses God as Adonai, as Yahweh, the deliverer God, and as Elohim. And then Samson says this, Oh God, please strengthen me just once more. Because with a hand on each pillar, as his life flashes before his eyes, he doesn't just see the great events and the deep failures. He sees something else, or more correctly, someone else. Judges chapter 13. The woman gave birth to a boy and named him Samson. He grew, and the Lord blessed him. And when it's underlined, say it with me. And the Spirit of the Lord began to stir. Chapter 14. The Spirit of the Lord came upon him in power so that he tore the young lion apart with his bare hands. Later on. Then the Spirit of the Lord came upon him in power and he went down to Ashkelon and struck down the 30 of their men. And then in chapter 15. The Spirit of the Lord came upon him in power and the ropes of his arms became like charred flax. And he picked up a jawbone and he struck down a thousand men. And then God opened up a hollow place in Lehi and water came out and his strength returned as he observes his life He sees amidst the greatness and the failure, the presence of God. So at the very end of his life, he prays now not to live, but to die. But he says, strengthen me once more because he realizes that all the way along it has been God, not his hair, not his muscles, that has given strength. That despite his deepest weakness, God has been with him. And so then we read the end of Samson's story. Standing blind, he places a hand on one pillar and a hand on another. And with his prayer on his lips, he pushes with all of his strength. And the building comes down on his enemies and on him. And we read at the end these words. And so at his death, he killed many more when he died than when he lived. The story of Samson is that in his death, he fulfilled his destiny. That it's at the very end that he finally does what he was born to do. Notice back at the all the way beginning at chapter 13 when the angel first came. You will conceive and give birth to a son. A razor may be used on his head because the boy is to be a Nazarite set apart to God from the womb and he will begin the deliverance of Israel from the hands of the Philistines. 
Samson began the deliverance. Because to a people who were acculturated and comfortable with the Philistines, Samson recreated the enmity. He reminded the Philistines and the Israelites that they were not friends but at war. That he brought down their rulers, but also he brought down the temple of their God, reminding Israel, Dagon is not God. Yahweh, Adonai, Elohim, the God of Israel, is God. He began the deliverance. But Samson's story doesn't end with a body in the rubble of a pagan temple. Notice the gracious postscript. Verse 31, Then his brothers and his father's whole family went down to get him. They brought him back and buried him between Zorah and Eshtal in the tomb of Manoah, his father. Who is Samson? What is his mission? Who is his identity? He has spent his life seeking it in the wrong places, but at the end, like the prodigal son, he is brought back, not to the arms of a welcoming father, but at least to the tomb. He is restored to Israel and to his identity as a child of God. But that's not the end of Samson's story either. Roman, Hebrews chapter 11. And what more shall I say? I do not have time to tell about Samson, David, Samuel, and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, who gained what was promised, whose weakness was turned to strength. The story of Samson is God's power made perfect in weakness. Now in closing, how can that be? Well, it can be because Scripture is one story. And this man who lived in a village in the Sorek Valley so many years ago is part of that bigger story. I mentioned scholars have for years shown that there are parallels that are very interesting between Samson and Jesus. Both had their births announced by an angel. Both were miraculously conceived. Both were betrayed by their own countrymen. Both were sold for pieces of silver. Both were mocked by their foreign oppressors. Both died with their hands stretched out. And in their death, both brought deliverance. And yet, of course, Samson is a very imperfect Christ. In fact, rather than being a parallel, I'd say it's more he's a pointer to our need for Jesus. Samson was selfish. Jesus emptied himself. Samson lived a life of disobedience. Jesus lived a life of perfect obedience. Samson died with a cry, give me vengeance. Jesus died with a cry, Father, forgive. Samson points to the need, not just in his life and Israel's life, but in our lives, when our lives flash before our eyes of a God who will gather the broken pieces and on a cross make them whole. So Richard duct taped the tube, put it in the pipe of his SUV, went in to get drunk on wine to come out and to end it all. In the hotel room, this dumpy place, he turned on a TV and it happened to be a televangelist who was speaking. And what he was speaking about was this thing called the cross. And a man who had come not to seek his own good, but to die that those with broken lives may be made whole. And in that moment, Richard, who had never heard anything about Christianity found himself putting his hands on the television screen and weeping and confessing his brokenness and his failure to this Savior. He went and he bought a Bible and began to read about who God was, and he eventually found himself in a Catholic church confessing his sins to a priest and asking the priest to call to get him arrested. The priest had to call four different law enforcement agencies before one believed him that he had a most wanted fugitive. The FBI came and picked Richard up. He went to jail for 18 years. His wife died, his mother died in jail, pain, but also new beginnings. This is what Richard writes. As I reflect black, I can see how a dollar sign sat at the throne of my heart for many years. For Samson, maybe seeking women, sat in his heart's throne. But Jesus now sits on that throne today. Prison gave me the opportunity to grow in Christ and to finally become the person God wanted me to be. What remains of my life is dedicated to the Lord's work. I am at peace now, enjoying the fruits of helping others. Richard is 75 and is now working with prisoners, telling them the same story of redemption that he experienced. 
A God whose power is made perfect in weakness. A God who takes our failures and through the cross brings new beginnings. That's the story of Samson, and that is our story too. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, each of us, unless the trumpet sounds, will face a moment of death. And as the busy activities of our brains fade into the dark, in those final moments when our memories of the life we've lived in you flash before us, and we survey all that has happened from beginning to end, we thank you that our lives are held in you. That from before we were born, that from our mother's womb, you have called us and given us a name. That we are, by grace, children of God. And that even at the end of our lives, we go forward knowing that you have prepared a place for us. Not in our father's tomb, but in our father's house. Father, we thank you for the brokenness of Samson and the healing of Christ. May this be true in each of our lives now, for we pray in Jesus' name and all of us say, Amen. Samson was given an identity and a mission at the end that he fulfilled by grace at the end. We respond by singing, Who You Say I Am. seated. And as children of God, with each failure redeemed, a new identity given, we come to him in prayer as we do what item of prayer as a congregation. I got a text yesterday from Dell and Lori Voss, who members of church now living in South Carolina. Dell's mother died on Saturday, 93 years old. They're on their way back for the funeral. We want to pray for Dell and for Lori and their family in this loss. That would you please pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for the wonder 
that we who were enemies of you have through the blood of Christ been made children. That we who were slaves to sin are now co-heirs with Christ. Father, we thank you for the restoration of our true identity, the restoration of our purpose and our mission in this world that you are redeeming in Christ. Heavenly Father, I pray for those in this congregation who don't yet know Jesus, those listening on the radio or by internet. Heavenly Father, we pray in this moment that you would make us to be children of God. As we invite you, Jesus, through your Holy Spirit, into our hearts to take up your throne, renouncing sin and finding in you our all in all. Heavenly Father, for those of us who belong to you but now find ourselves wandering like Richard, finding ourselves doing things and in places we never thought we would be, we thank you for the invitation to come back, to not be defined by our failure or our disappointments, but to find in you redemption and the full forgiveness of sins. Heavenly Father, we thank you that this gift of your gospel is not just true for us, but it's something that you invite us to share. We thank you with Lucas Doubledy for the chance to learn and to grow in his call to missions and Costa Rica over these past months, and we pray that you would continue your work in him and in each of our young people. We thank you for Stan Winnie and his team serving in a different season of life, but now in a short-term trip to Nicaragua. We pray that they would be an encouragement to those who are serving and living and working in Nicaragua, that you keep Stan and his team safe, and that you would bless your kingdoms coming in and through them. Father, we thank you for the staff of this church. We thank you for those who serve on each committee, for our care and concern group coordinators. We thank you for the congregations that we worship beside in this community. We thank you today, especially for Christ's community, for Pastor Randy and Pastor Carlos. Father, we thank you that they with us are children of God, called to your kingdom. Gracious God, we do with thanksgiving praise you for the answers to prayer you've given. We thank you that you brought Andrew and Brittany Notaboom safely home from Liberia with McKinsey and Madeline. Father, even as McKinsey now continues to recover from malaria, we pray that you would bless this new family as they adopt to one another. And Heavenly Father, that you would give wisdom and strength to this, these parents and blessings to these two little girls. Father, we thank you for bringing Mary Hoagland home last week Sunday and Evelyn Bremen home last week Sunday. We pray for continued healing for both of them. We thank you that Annette Van Voris could be carried through a surgery this week and that she could come home on Friday. We pray, Lord, in this road of recovery for her that you'll give her patience and good rest, strengthening and health. Heavenly Father, we pray for Fran Moss beginning chemotherapy in this past week. We ask that you would walk beside her and Myron and their family. You would bless this chemo that she's received and now in 21 days as she receives another dose, that you would continue to walk beside this family. Holy Father, we pray for your blessing on Liz Gaysink as she prepares for surgery this coming Tuesday. May you also go beside her, or later in this month, Lord, may you go beside her and continue to give her strength. Holy Father, we pray for your healing grace to continue to be with Jim Vermeer and Jolene, that you would continue to restore mobility and strength to both sides of his body after a stroke, that you would preserve memory, that you would preserve the ability to communicate clearly, and Heavenly Father, that you would restore him home if that's your will. We continue to pray for Ron Holsoff, for Cassidy, for Eva and Dunkelar, for others in our congregation who struggle with chronic conditions, with journeys with cancer, with therapy as part of our lives. Lord, we pray for your restoration. We pray especially today for those who grieve. We pray you walk beside Joyce Heinen and her family as they grieve the loss of a sister-in-law, Leona. You walk beside Erwin and Karen DeBoer as they grieve the unexpected death of a nephew, Jerry. And that you walk beside Dell and Lori and their family as they grieve the loss of a beloved mother. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are a God who knows our pain, who numbers our tears, who is yourself through Christ not unfamiliar with our suffering or our temptation. So Father, we lift before you our brokenness, our weakness, our hopes, our dreams. We thank you for hearing us and for working in us. Father, as we give you our gifts and our offerings, we pray you'd use them to we offer all things in Jesus' name. Amen. Before offerings, I would like to invite Lucas Doubledy up. Again, he was commissioned by this church. We supported him in his work in Costa Rica. And he's just going to give a brief report, and then we'll see a video during the offertory, hopefully in the coming weeks, so I'll also be able to do a longer thing after a service. So, welcome. Thank you. 
first question for you, just for those who don't know, what have you been doing the past five months? Uh, okay, so for the past five months, I've been working with YWAM at something called the DTS, which is a discipleship training school, and that focuses on primarily with your relationship with God, growing in your relationship with God, kind of like hearing His voice, kind of just experiencing Him in, in, in an unprecedented new way. Right. And as you think about five months in Costa Rica doing that, what's a story where you saw God at work? So, uh, oh, there's a lot of them. Yeah, I know there is, yeah. <laughs> um, but one of the stories that uh, I just kind of wrote out, um, so we were in a place, it's called Alto Quetzal, and and uh, we were working with this indigenous people. And just one night, um, I think it was a little after midnight, there was just a, it, just a spirit of fear, and just this violent wind started all around us where we were staying. And um, one of my friends, she woke up, and, uh, and it was just creepily cold on us, actually, and just the wind was violent, and then she... So we were saying there was a kitchen. There was a kitchen connected to our room. So she went out into the kitchen, and the doors blew wide open, and it was just that yeah, just violent wind. And in the name of Jesus Christ, she just commanded the spirit of fear to go away. The doors completely shut, and the wind completely stopped. Just completely stopped. As and that 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 just absolutely blew my mind away. And that just showed me, you know, the authority, the absolute authority that we have through Jesus Christ and through the Holy Spirit. Yeah, praise God. And you've got lots of other stories you're going to share hopefully some other time after service, but if you think about a lesson or two that God's taught you, what can we learn with you from this past five months? Uh, one of the biggest lessons that um, God taught me was that we have authority, that we have the authority to command Satan when he's, when he's doing that thing, when he's poking at us, when he's, when he's causing these things in our life that, that, when Satan is attacking us in our life, we have the authority to tell him to shut up and to go away. And we have the authority to stomp down on his head. That's the biggest thing that uh, God has taught me over the past five months is that we can tell Satan no. He has no control over us. See, one of the biggest thing, another thing that I learned was that, so heaven and hell, they work like a hierarchy. God's the king. Jesus is the prince. We're just under Jesus then that's the angels, and then under all that, it's Satan, his demons, and, his, and, and the spirits. And we have the authority and the, ability, and the ability to say, no, you're not going to control me anymore. And, yeah, I just wanted to share that with y'all this morning. Oh, thank you, Lucas. And yeah, I invite you to talk with Lucas. I'm not just spiritual warfare, just some of the things God taught you about prayer, about dependence on God, about how God speaks to us today, and the spirits work in our lives. And again, we're just thankful for that experience for you, but also we want to learn with you uh, what God's up to in this world. So, so very good. Well, I'm going to um, pray for Lucas. If you're able, let's even extend your hands as we, we walk, receive him back and, and welcome him, and then we're going to give our offerings. Let's pray. Oh, yeah. Um, and also, just, okay, also, just before we pray, um, I just want to thank you, uh, all of you, um, from the bottom of my heart. Thank you so much for your prayers and your support to my family um, in this time that I was gone and just... Uh, the prayers, financial support, and then just especially the prayers, they were um, beyond helpful. They were beyond um, supportive, and, and I can't thank you all enough. All right. so. Thank you, Lucas. Yeah, let's, let's pray. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we confess that we get comfortable with going through the motions, with a relationship with you that is predictable and doesn't challenge us. And we thank you for the opportunity at times to step outside our comfort zones, to step into new parts of your world and new experiences with new people and to see that you are God who is at work in our lives, even as Samson saw at the end. Heavenly Father, we thank you for bringing Lucas safely through this experience, not just physically, but spiritually and emotionally, relationally. We thank you for the relationships that he formed with his teammates and with those that they served. We thank you for the work of your Holy Spirit in his body, in his mind, in his soul, for the lessons that you've taught, for the seeds that you've planted. And Heavenly Father, we pray that these seeds would not just bear fruit in Lucas's life, but also in this congregation. That you'd use him as a catalyst to stir us to new experiences of you, to new expressions of your authority, to deeper hunger and prayer, to new experiences of what mission can look like in our own neighborhoods and in our own families. Heavenly Father, may you continue also to lead Lucas as he goes forward in you and each of our young people, for we commend him to you in Jesus' name and all of us say, amen. Welcome back. We give our gifts and our offerings, first for the ministries of this congregation, second for Christian education. So today we're going to watch a, a video of Lucas and his team in Costa Rica. 
Again, in a couple of weeks, well, we hope to have Lucas after our service to have some Q&A and to explain a little bit more what God was doing. We're thankful we could do this with him this morning. As we finish the service, our closing song reminds us that one day we will stand before God in our prayer as we would survey our life in him. The song, let it be said of us that the Lord was our passion and by his spirit we are made strong. Let's stand to sing that after the parting blessing. So please stand, we'll receive the parting blessing, and then we'll sing that as our closing song. Let it be said of us. Friends, receive this blessing from Second Thessalonians. May our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who loved us and by his grace gave us eternal encouragement and good hope, 
May he encourage your hearts and strengthen you in every good deed and word. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen. Thank you.